All right, joining the pod, I have Seth Part now. Now, let me go through here. I'm looking at your your Twitter here to make sure I have all the different job titles correct here. So, <laughs> currently, director of North American Sports at Stats Bomb. We had uh, your boss uh, Ted Knutson on the on the pod a, a number of months ago. So, you're working with him there. Are you still currently an author of The Athletic? Should I ask, since they've just laid off people over there? Are you still doing any work there? I, I, I do still contribute to The Athletic, do some podcasting there. Uh, I'm sort of the uh, internal basketball analytics consulting arm for, for the writing staff there. Okay, so we're, we're, we're still in good standing there. Previously, director of basketball research for the Milwaukee Bucks. I mistakenly said Minnesota Timberwolves as we were leading into this. But, you know, man, at least, you know, at least some of the letters are correct there. Um, when we're talking about this, uh, Mastodon, how, how, how are things going to Mastodon? I, it's, you know, I haven't updated my, uh, <laughs> I, 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 there's probably some social that I can, I can, I can alter. I, I made, uh, you know, I try, I, I've tried out the various platforms as, uh, as Elon Musk's Twitter has done what Elon Musk's Twitter has done. But there's another one too, blue something, blue, blue sky. Yeah. Blue sky. Um, I see. I, that's just like yeah. Minnesota, Milwaukee. I can't yeah. get these things. Spoutable is another one. Uh, Spoutable. none of them have really, none of them seem like they've really hit yet. Okay. Well, we'll yeah, we'll see what happens. Someone can buy uh, Twitter when it files for bankruptcy and comes out of bankruptcy in another uh, six months or so. Okay. So I'm hit. I hit everything there. And you know, as part of my extensive research that I do for this podcast, I was listening to a podcast that you had done in the past with with Ben Taylor of Thinking Basketball, who I'm going to have on this pod in a bit here. And I was like, this is great. I could you know listen to both perspectives. I can get kind of some some overarching philosoph philosophy of analytics, everything else. And then I just proceeded to hear an hour of talk about whether uh, Rudy Gobert is underrated or severely underrated. So it, it, you, you didn't help me out there. Uh, sorry. <laughs> That's well, that, that, that's, with this. that's a take that maybe hasn't hasn't it was a it was a uh a rough I think you were in the more Islands. underrated camp. You were in yeah. the more underrated camp, but you know a guy who falls into okay, Jokic probably falls into like in, in a different sort of way. Obviously, much more of an offensive focus uh, um, than a defensive focus with with Gobert, but probably would have also have been like a nerd favorite before this whole run versus you know your your basketball guys your 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 hooper guys like who are there that are just sticking to um how they feel and playoffs and what matters and all those sorts of things what do you think about Jokic coming out of this series now um i always look at this kind of like underrated overrated paradigm and i'm seeing some wild takes out there on him on him already about whether or not he could be you know, like the greatest center ever. I think I saw a, a, I mean, some, a, something there. So <laughs> where do we stand with him right now? In general, I'm, I'm team like calm down about, uh, about like, you know, he won his championship. That's great. Yes. A lot. Like, could he reach certain heights? Could he end up with a better career than Steph Curry? Could he end up as a, yes, these things are in play, but let's let them play instead of like, annoying them to begin with. So I, I, I don't really want to get ahead of ourselves by imagining like, yes, if he wins three titles in the next five years and, and you know, all these things, well, yes, well, we will think of him, you know, in sort of someplace in the firmament. And the fact that that's in play says a lot, but let's let it, let it, let it breathe. Let the thing happen instead of trying to be, let's be right rather than first, I guess yeah. is, is what I'll say about this. Um, so you you mentioned uh, uh, statistical darling. The interesting thing about about Jokic is he's a guy who even going back to in his draft profile, he was a guy who was kind of a statistics darling. And then you watch him play, and he was not in nearly the the, the, the shape he's in now. He was, I used to, I don't know, forty pounds heavier than he is now. And it's like, well, this guy can this guy knows how to play basketball, but I'm just not sure if he's an NBA level athlete. And then he got to his first summer league. And he was like the third best, pro third most uh, well-known prospect on the on the Denver summer league team. It was a very good summer league team, and but there's a guy named Emmanuel Moutier who was a very high guard prospect who was like the guy on that team who was everyone's excited about. Uh, but you watched him, was like, yeah, that Jokic, I mean, you know, I, he's not a he, he's below the rim player. He's not fast, but he knows how to play. Maybe he could be something. And then, you know, fast forward a couple of years and it's, it's, uh, uh, he becomes an all-star player and then, you know, has been certainly arguably the best player in, in the world over the last three years. So just the, the, you could see something was there, but, um, I think 
anyone who tells you that they saw this would be absolutely have been lying to you. Um, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I don't think I don't think this. I guess I'm just trying to get like I, I, I guess I still put him in the category. Maybe I'm wrong, and you can correct me on this. That if somehow. I don't know. Obviously, it wasn't really close to going sideways against the Lakers. But if, if, if it had gone sideways against, I don't know, the Suns, let's say, and they didn't end up getting out of that series, wouldn't he have still been put in this larger bucket of like, yeah, regular season MVP, but can't get it done in the playoffs because the playoffs are different for all of these reasons. And I, mean, I do think in the NBA, there is like a bigger difference between the playoffs and the regular season than there is in the NFL and other places. Um, but he still would have like I think it's a pretty dramatic difference, right? If he would have if you would have gone out against the Suns versus making this run here, he's gonna be, historically, and this is just the way that it ends up sometimes, based upon the same exact player, a few results go differently. Like this has been a huge boost to his like historical standing in the eyes of many who would have discounted him with another early-ish playoff exit. Uh, I mean, my response to that is, where have you been? I think that that you know once you. You know, if if yes, if you just look well, he lost in the first and second round in the last two years, and you pretend we know nothing else. Like there's no, well, nothing else happened. So, the fact that some that people he, do that though, some people yeah. do do that though. Yeah, I mean the, the the like the fact that he was playing with you know the you know his starting point guard in the last two playoffs is not in the NBA anymore. In 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 Facuno Campazzo, like the like his uh, the starting two guard from last year was like the ninth man on Minnesota in Austin rivers. So um, like that kind of matters uh, that, that you, you have to be the guy and you have to have, you know, the people around you. I think that the number of players who in this era could be like, it doesn't matter who you have. They just win. Uh, I think is zero. So uh, you know, you have, you might have to go back to like the odds to win. The league was, was not as competitive as it is today when you could put whoever around LeBron and they would be competitive. That's not the case anymore. And so the fact that on an individual level, his playoff performances are pretty unassailable and the team didn't have success because the second and fourth best players in the team weren't available. <laughs> like it's, it's you and, and pretending that that didn't happen as a way of saying, well, this guy who does things differently and is slightly roly poly and isn't a, a vertical athlete and whatnot. Um, it's it's facile and really inattentive to what's actually gone on. Do you think um, did Michael Jordan ruin basketball analysis? Because like, like, now I've been an, I've been you know an NBA fan for a long time, kind of trailing off in, in recent years. But I'll say that people kind of forget like the the struggles that Jordan had at one point in time, or at least back then it was more like there was a handing of the torch between let's say the Celtics to the Pistons and then the Pistons to the Bulls. But the fact that he just won out. For his career, other than the late comeback, you know, when he was beyond his, uh, you know, the, 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 I, I'm discounting the Wizards sort of stuff yeah. to, to come uh, out here. And then, other than the half season where he came back and, and, and they didn't quite make it, he was the closest thing to saying, like, he had this unbeatable sort of aura around him that I don't think any other player has had. And whether it's, it's correct or not, I don't know. But he did win every single championship when they had a full season to do so. Scotty Pippen is a top. I, I'm probably higher on Scotty Pippen historically yeah. than, than most, but Scotty Pippen is a top 50, certainly, maybe even as high as like top 30, top yeah. 25 player of all time. Yeah. So it's not like, so it's, it's pretending that it was just like MJ and nobody is like, again, if we look at what he did, he scored 63 against the Celtics in a playoff game, in a game they lost. So, yeah. um, until Scotty Pippen and Horace Grant show up, does does he have a lot of play? Even then, like it couldn't just be him. Um, best player wins is a great starting point for for basketball analysis, but it also has to be the guys around them that can enable that to happen. Um, you know, there's there's been you know there, there's been times the last two playoff runs where Jokic maybe wore down because he had to do literally everything. He can, he's a guy who is great in part because he can play a point guard like role at times. But when you actually like all like the, 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 the top two point guards on Denver and in, in uh, um, uh, Jamal Murray and Monte Morris, who they then traded were injured last year. So you're, you're your third string point guard. So he's having to play point guard and center 
and do everything defensively and score all the time. It's like, yes, he got tired because humans get tired and the NBA is very demanding. So uh, I think that, that to get back to actually answering your question, I think, yes, in some ways MJ did because there's just like this mythos about like the cult of personality and the one person doing it all on their own, like context, like without any even nod towards the context of which, of who they're playing with, who they're playing against that factors in. I, I do think that that has made us um, as a uh, broadly speaking, very surface level and facile about our basketball analysis. It's like, you know, uh, Jimmy Butler failed. Jimmy Butler got the heat to the finals. Like, but this, this, they were the eight seed and they got to the, like getting there was, the, was a triumph. And then they ran into a better team and that's what happens because 29 teams aren't the best team. Yeah. Well, of course we all know um, Michael Jordan, in fact, never got tired though. So that was the thing. He would stay up until <laughs> till 4 right. a.m. playing cards, sleep for an hour and a half, uh, do 36 holes of golf and then go uh, and then go play in the, in the NBA finals or so, or so, or so we're, we're led to believe um, uh, the food poisoning stories and other things uh, along with it. All right. I'm going to hit you with, okay. So, so I didn't even mention your book, mid range theory. Everyone should check that out. Got a Kindle uh, copy myself. I just like this quote that you had at the very beginning. So I want to talk about this and this will be an overarching thing. Obviously you're working with football stuff now, so we can talk about some of the differences with, basketball football analytics everything else but i think this this applies to a lot of stuff here so i'm gonna i'm gonna quote you to you and then have you respond to yourself that's always a good good podcasting here so it says here it says you're talking about your book mid-range show you said this book is not about analytics i hate analytics not the discipline mind you but the word the word has become hopelessly poisoned reduced confused and misapplied but we're stuck with the word so we might as well define it properly uh, he says, before we do so, there are plenty of misconceptions to cast aside. So here is what won't be in this book. One neat trick to solve basketball. So what is what? Let's just talk about this whole word, because I've heard people talk about this in the NFL, too. Should should we even use this word? Should we not be using this word? H have you come to terms with the fact that we have to use the word despite all of the misconceptions about it? And then how do we think about analytics when it comes to any, any, any sport? Um, I think we're stuck with it. And I think it's unfortunate yeah. because I think a lot of things are getting sort of subsumed into various strands. There's like, you know, there's the, the, the technological aspect of it, which is, you know, you see this probably most clearly in, in baseball where, you know, teams almost have, uh, many teams almost have two what we would call analytics groups. There's like the analysis group, and then the the platform and application group that's that's building the tools that everyone uses to to disseminate the information. That's really, I mean, and that really is what it uh, boils down to is uh, the the uh, programmatic use of information to influence uh, decision making, um, and and that doesn't roll off the tongue in quite the same way. Um, but it's not a, it's not a series of tenets of like, if you do this, that is analytics. It's like, we think about things this way. We start from this point, how we ask questions, how we gather the information to answer those questions, how we disseminate those answers, how we build those answers, those answers into an overall decision-making flow. That's really what the thing is. Um, but it gets reduced in our vernacular. Like Moneyball is just like on base percentage, and that's not that's not what Moneyball was. Moneyball was, uh, you know, undervalued undervalued uh, traits. Um, but and the specific example was that um, in NBA's, it's like uh, it's three pointers are analytics, and that's not that's part that that is a part of it. That was a um, and some empirical work that was enabled by kind of. Uh, the statistical collation, uh, collation of stuff that then you use statistical methodology and almost basic math in many cases leads you to to, to certain realizations about the value of areas of the court. Um, but that's a, that's a, that's an application, not the thing itself. And it gets so and, and and the poisoning is like I don't think the game should be should be played this way, and it's 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 analytics fault. That, that this player made that decision. And that's always kind of 
players did dumb things before we came along too. You know, it's, it, it's almost, it, it's, it's on, um, there, there's a, I'm going to make a very dated reference. There's a, there's a scene in season four of the West wing where, where, uh, Josh Molina's character is is begging for there to be rain so that s- suppresses a vote count in an election. And he walks outside and he goes, come on. And it starts raining. And then he said, wow, what else can I do? That's sort of how I feel about like all the things that analytics get, get, get blamed for is like, Oh, if I can do that for my next neat trick, watch what else I can, I can, I can ruin, I can change. So, um, it's almost become a useful scapegoat for a thing. I don't like whether or not, that thing has anything to do with what is truly going on in the work of statistical analysis and application and communication and decision-making processes. Yeah. The, the, I guess the dichotomy of, of thought between how analytics is viewed and how maybe I would think about it. Some of it just has to do purely with this other view of being, a certain type of person and a certain type of tool or, you know, using data, using some sort of modeling, some sort of machine learning, some sort of process there. And the certain type of person does it, it's quote unquote analytics, where I guess when I try to think about it more holistically, and maybe analytics isn't the right word for this a holistic sort of view, it's kind of just using the best tool for the most insight or value that you can get. And sometimes it is those things. Sometimes it's not those things. But then how do we bring those two things together when like you worked within uh, an MBA organization and you are the director of research? Does it end up being like a siloed sort of thing, though, inside these organizations where it's okay? that's our analytics, which is certain person using certain tools for certain insights, whereas it should be no, we're looking at everything in this kind of thoughtful, intentional sort of way. And sometimes we're doing this and sometimes we're doing that in order to get the best results. So this is something that, that comes up, uh, you know, when, when I'm not a huge fan of rankings, uh, in, in general, but you know, gotta get those clicks. Yeah. Those yeah. Clicks. They, they, they do do clicks. Um, I, you know, I, I do player tiers, which is as close as I'm comfortable with doing ratings. Uh, but we, they, they, you know, they, they, uh, various outlets come out with like the, the analytics ranking, like which organizations are, are the most analytic, analytically forward or, or what have you. And it's really, it's something that is actually more on two axes than rather this team is or isn't. There's kind of level of investment on, on kind of as, as one dimension and then level of, of, I guess you would call integration as the other one. And there are teams that have very like low dollar amount, low, uh, 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 count. I, you know, um, I, I think the Denver, like the nuggets basically only had, had one dedicated analytics staffer prior to this season, but they've been an organization that has gotten a ton out of it. Like congratulations and shout out to they, Lane Vashro. At, they have at, a weird, they have a weird structure. I don't know if they still have it, but like Cronky used to have a separate analytics organization that was somehow advising because he has the Avalanche too, right? Yeah. And then and yeah. then the Rams, and then I guess Arsenal also, but yeah. that's probably a whole separate thing. Um, and where he was kind of like advising all those. I don't know if they had like integration or adoption, as you know, as you might say, but I guess they had some other staffers outside of the Nuggets, which may have fed some information into them. That group eventually got folded back into the the uh, the teams. It was um, it did okay. Okay, it, it was the unfortunately the exec who was uh, kind of overseeing that 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 project. Um, uh, uh, Brett Barrett, who's a, a wonderful human being, who uh, was one of the great storytellers I've ever met, but he was kind of that was his vision, and he passed away unfortunately uh, a, a couple of years ago. And after he died, they they kind of, but it was like the people from that who had been working with the Avs then embedded with the Avs, and a lot of the success that they've had is uh, you know they have influenced the success. I, I, I'm hesitant to give credit to one thing or another because any of these decisions are very multivariate. And so like, well, which one of those did the, did the, did the, the, the analyst push over the line? I don't know, but it's like over time you have the influence, you make better decisions. Um, and then Lane has been first with the Cronky sports group. And then with the, 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 the Nuggets has been there half a decade or like it was six or seven years. And, but he was basically a one man shop for a long time, but he was integrated into their process at a, you know, at a 
start from we're answering the asking the questions. You're in the room when we're asking the questions. So you know what we care about. So all through the process, you can address those questions, not the sort of garbled version that we know how to ask. This is, um, and there are teams uh, on the flip side, and I won't name, I won't, I'll, I'll withhold names to protect the guilty, but there are teams that are spending a lot of money, have a lot of people that get nothing out of it because it's, they're just this group in the basement that's tapping away on their computers and they send reports out. And it's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an adjunct. It's a, it's, it is, it is completely siloed off. So um, you can get a lot with a little, as long as you, use it correctly as long as you make it about asking the question not like not like you're looking up a uh you know it's not you're just looking up a stat on on whether it's basketball football hockey reference or whatever you're asking the question and then figuring out how from the available data to answer it now sometimes that available data is in fact statistical sometimes it's it's the more traditional data and i think that this is where the line of demarcation between like traditional and metrics, I think is, is dumb and antiquated because qualitative data is data in the same way that quantitative data is. And when you really scratch the surface, like there's a lot of qualitative elements in any of the, the so-called quantitative data. Like we have decided this is important and therefore we are tracking it. There's a qualitative element to this is important enough to be, to look out for. And at the same time, like the, you know, using the football example, um, four three speed is a is 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 quantitative, and that's and that's sort of something that the traditional scouting process has relied on. Um, you know, you've, you know, yards, attempts, touchdown, whatever, sacks, all of these things. They they are they are whether or not they're predictive and useful. Some more than others but those are quantitative. So everyone is using a, a mixture of both and the sort of bright line demarcation between the two is, is the problem. And the teams that knock that down and say, yes, you're specialized in this area, but you data person and you traditional scout person need to be able to talk to each other, um, both and understand what each other's saying, but also sort of on equal footing as, as colleagues, um, so that we collectively come to the best decisions. The teams that have set that structure up are the teams that are doing well with it. And the teams that haven't are lighting money on fire. Okay. Well, let's, okay. Where does the buck stop when it comes to making this happen? Is it the the general manager or the equivalent that really is the person that we care about here? Is it I don't know, some some other level of the organization? Is it the head of research and how they are able to influence and, uh, I don't know, sell, you know, in a way and establish relationships and do those sort of things. Um, in the NBA, can it even be some of the players who are very influential, which I don't think is really the case in the NFL, but maybe in the NBA, players actually have sway because you're scared about losing players in a way that you aren't necessarily in the NFL. Who Who, who is the person that's going to help make this happen more than anyone else? Or does it have to be a, a combination? Uh, to some degree, it's a combination. I think it can happen at the, you know, we have a lot of uh, esoteric titles that the lead decision maker in basketball ops has, but we colloquially yeah. call them GMs. Right. The, it, it can start with the GM, but really the most, the, the, the surest way to make sure it happens is if it's something kind of from ownership, we are going to do things this way. Um, and those are, and, and those tend to be now, sometimes it is, that has been the GM has managed upwards to say, Hey, we're going to spend money on this and integrate this in our process. Are you cool with that? And then yes. And then that's how the organization runs. Um, I would say that the, the sort of the head of research, the head of analytics or whatever, um, I don't think they can create that culture, but they can break it if they are um, a bad communicator. Um, it's an interesting thing about like the, 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 the analysts, certainly the head analyst, the head of research position is it is, I mean, I think you mentioned that they're bad at selling. It's a sales job. Yeah. It's, you've got to like, you have to, and by the way, that's not a pejorative. Like 
scouting is sales too. You're convincing the room that like this guy is good or bad and should be wherever he is on our draft board. Like you have to not just, well, I watched the tape and he's great. It's like, okay, well, <laughs> cool. Um, you have to, you have to tell a story that people buy and, um, some of the failings of adoption are, I think, um, on the, the analyst side for not communicating well. Okay. Um, well, okay. When it comes to the sales side of it, I'm interested in this because there's often discussions in the public sphere where, um, analytical types will be accused sometimes fairly of, arrogance for lack of a better word or what we may deem as overconfidence in different opinions. And I think often it's not that they're any more confident than another type of opinion, but there's like an inherent legitimacy that's seen in certain opinions versus other opinions. So we're talking about, let's say you versus in an organization versus a scout who has, you know, played and whatever, did whatever like that. Don't you, aren't these things viewed differently kind of inherently in the degree of confidence you have? And therefore I always wonder, like, is it our job as the nerds to then know that and frame things in a different way? Or should we be okay with the fact of saying it's okay that we have this degree of confidence and it's just other people's like natural bias against our opinions in the first place is what's causing this opinion of arrogance. There's a few things to like, I'll, I'll take the two sides of that. One, I okay. think when I talked earlier about sort of the top down imposition of we are going to, this is the way we are going to communicate as an organization. Um, part of that is so that we're not, you're not saying that, all right, this is the main decision. And then this other group affects it. You know, they can, right. they can be, a, they can, they can nudge up or down or something like that. Um, there's nothing you can do on the, the research side and the analysis side that will overcome that sort of internal uh, thumb of the scale. Like you can, you can, you can make the problem worse, but you can't really make it better because that that's the organ, the way the organization has chosen to run either implicitly or explicitly is that we base our decisions on this. And then we check the box of talking to, and it's not just analytics. It's like background intel. It's medical. It's, you know, all these other other factors that that, that might play in. Um, on the practitioner side, I think the first thing you have to start with is realize that just by putting a number on something, you're giving the appearance of sort of certainty and precision that I think that's something that we, since we as practitioners sort of know, well, that's not a, that's not a, uh, that's not a, that's not a firm value. That's the center point of a distribution. And we have, right, you know, right. you have various confidence intervals around and blah, blah, blah. Like we all internally know that, but when it's communicated externally, it is like that sort of nuance is lost and, and is very difficult to explain actually to, to, to sort of people without, um, a firm grounding in sort of uh, uh, statistical reasoning. And, it, and it's um, always going to be like wrong in a concrete way right. to some degree in the future, right? Like you could right. always point to it and say you were wrong to some degree when you make something that, yeah. that, that, you know, like a finite value basically. Yeah. How come your model doesn't predict that this 36 year old didn't fall off? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, we could we could if we could build that into the model and then the the model would be worse overall and it's going to miss on some people what do you want from me but no i mean it's so but but starting from that standpoint so you do have to recognize that there is sort of a um whatever you say is going to is going to you're going to sound like you're coming in hotter than you actually are yeah kind of just because of that putting a number on thing um and then there's the 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 the, the problem is largely linguistic rather than um if you deliver your findings in basketball, you can present it with the nuance and the why you think this and, and, you know, where, you know, what, what maybe this, this number, this model isn't saying, if you present it in the language of data, that's, that, that's the, even if someone like, you know, 
it's 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 even if the 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 person on the decision maker is uh is conversational they aren't fluent in it so i think then getting back again to the sales point like you have to talk the sport it has to the subject matter expertise has to be there um and i think that that's been a change over the last probably decade in sports is i think the advent of tracking data has actually allowed for that sport language to be brought into the data in ways that it maybe wasn't before um in the, in the basketball example when the best thing we had was play by play data there's stuff you can do with it and you can build models and you can player value and stuff like this and it's um okay well your model says he's good show me the play that that why he's good and you you kind of can't um now with the tracking data with the event level stuff that you can kind of you know use these models to to then you know build iterate further on to, to sort of value like like kind of the atomic actions of the game then you can say well he, he does this well he does that well um he does this more often and that now we're talking about basketball we're not talking about numbers and now we're having a conversation where oh wow i didn't you know now that you mentioned that i did kind of see that in the tape but i didn't realize it at the time or it's like i don't agree with that let's go back and watch some more and see what we see so there's a there's a shared once you get to that point there's a there's a shared language that you can actually have the discussion on Whereas if you're if you're in the, the realm of like numbers and algorithms and formulas, you're 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 never going to communicate well because you're literally speaking two different languages. Well, let's 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 start the talk. And this is going to be a, you know, a, a, a biggish theme of, of what I want to talk about is your experience and then continued analysis in the NBA versus what you're doing with stats bomb now moving into football uh i guess primarily would you say in college football is the is the target market now or or no uh i think the co college football data is is okay. certainly the 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 um you know and nfl has the, the nfl tracking data is is pretty good um yeah. so um but there is no real there is not a widespread analog in in the college space um for that Okay. Okay. So when so when you're having these conversations with probably a pretty diverse set of uh, decision makers and all of these different um, college football programs, is it a lot of deja vu when you're talking about things that you had to do as far as with with basketball and getting people to to understand what you're doing being able to talk on the same level because you're talking about tracking a little bit more as you were so using the same language or are there like fundamental differences just between the sports where it makes it more difficult or easier in some ways to be able to get buy-in from decision makers that this has real value for them some of both okay um there is some, there is definitely some, some deja vu about kind of those, the, that linguistic bit. Um, and, you know, frankly, I, I, I played basketball. I, you know, I, I, I played a couple of years at a deep. So, so speaking the language of, of basketball is something that was, that was, that was fairly easy, like a fairly easy, like taking the number and turning into a basketball thing was, um, and football is much more of a road game for me, but thankfully I have people who work for me who, who have, you know, have, you know, playing and coaching backgrounds who can, who can <laughs> do that at a much higher level than I can. Um, but the differences in the sport um, are pretty interesting and pretty key. Um, a lot of what we do in analytics and across sports in general is you're sort of extrapolating from the past. It's like when this thing has happened with these contextual factors, the outcome has been whatever, you know, if you're talking about a, you know, trying to do a, a, a shot quality model in, in, in the NBA, by and large, um, the, the, whatever shot this guy takes that has been over the 10 years we have tracking data. Now there's probably been 10,000 shots that are pretty similar. So that gives us a pretty robust sample to kind of know how it operates. Um, plus with there being, you know, a hundred possessions, give or take a game, there's a little bit of margin for error uh, on, on stuff. 
Um, I think with the very, um, you know, as next to baseball, is there a more uh, discreet sport than football? Uh, and so that both from a strategic standpoint, that's made everything so highly specific. You know, if you're doing, if you're working with basketball tracking data and you think a guy's two feet to the left or the right of where he actually was, it's not awesome, but it's not fatal. If you're looking at, you know, alignment data, you know, if you have a defensive lineman two foot, two feet to the right of where he actually was, you, you've changed everything about that play completely from, from an analysis standpoint. So the level of precision there, and then also because of that level of precision, your, and and the, the number of games are smaller and plays are relatively limited across a game, you don't have the massive sample size to to generalize. Like it's almost it's it's small sample size theater all the way down. So trying to find ways in which you can generalize to bring the weight of kind of history to bear, um, maybe more by analogy than by specifically like when they ran this play out of you know trips and against this coverage. Maybe that hasn't happened, but maybe something similar enough has happened that you can, you can, you can say some meaningful things about expectations and who should have done what or anything like that. Um, so that's a, that. I mean, that the 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 level of specificity in football, I think, is is just higher than it is um, I, in any other sport that I've that I've certainly and I've I've dabbled. You know, I've messed around with soccer data, I've messed around with hockey data. Everybody's messed around with baseball data. Um, so that's that's a, that is a challenge that I think is unique to gridiron football. It's interesting because, like, okay, so so the data side, and then let's say the insights from the data that you can produce if you're not in the building, let's say, or even a producer about opponents, I guess, if you are in the building. To me, it seems like there's that's a that's just a harder nut to crack when it comes to football than when it comes to the NBA when things are kind of there for you. Like if you're, if you're a, a perceptive viewer of the game, it's, it's kind of there for you to see. Whereas there's a lot of stuff that you just can never figure out. Even if you are a former professional and you're looking at it, people can have very different opinions of what's going on. So is, is that a key difference between the two sports? I would assume so from the outside looking in, but I'm not sure. Oh, I think that's a fair way to put it. Another, I mean, another way to, to think about it is we're sort of uh, earlier in the path in, in, in football, just in terms of how well kind of the more traditional measures capture what's gone on. Like again, you can put baseball on one side and probably soccer on the other side in terms of like what the, you know, the, 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 the paper shows up the next day and it's got like a, you know, a box score of the game. How well does this box score exp like expl explain like the nuances of what happened in a game, or or even you know the scorecard in baseball? The the the, the scorecard like the way we've kept score in baseball for a hundred plus years is actually pretty damn good. Basketball is not quite as good, but with play by play data, it's pretty good. I think with football, we haven't like just the basic building blocks of who was on the field, what was the formation, what play did they run what defense what, like what was the defense that, like just those basic like building blocks and collating those quickly and allowing people to see how they how they kind of interact with each other that stuff has all already happened earlier for these other sports and it, and it happens obviously at the, the coaching level they, they, there's a lot of this sort of nuance built in but from a a data and analysis level we don't really have this yet. And so a lot of the value comes from just like doing that stuff with consistency, with speed, with, you know, historical depth rather than running to wanting to do big, like player value, single number models and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I'm, I'm thinking about um, like work that I've seen from people who are on the outside do NBA work that has a quantitative bent to it. Um, for instance, like like I mentioned, uh, having having you know Ben on the on the pod, he does some quantitative stuff in addition to film breakdowns and other sorts of things. And I've seen people who were 
like football fans who would explicitly say, man, I wish like the nerds that are looking at, at football were anything close to this because this is so much better. But I'm, I'm kind of wondering whether just basketball fundamentally is like a sport that's easier to um, analyze, especially on the broadcast tape that we're talking about here. Um, and that can kind of build a sort of credibility. Or do you think the nerds are as maligned within by basketball fans there as the, as the football nerds are by football fans? Um, it's probably pretty close to be honest. <laughs> okay. Um, I think but there's, I, yeah. there's sort of there, I mean, the, because basketball had a little bit of head start, at least sort of, um, it's getting this way. My perception is, is getting this way in football where, um, there's at least a desire to be seen as smart in this level. Yeah. Whereas I think a big difference between, uh, the NBA and the NHL is it's it regardless of how you actually do the thing internally like you know the level of opprobrium that a basketball decision maker would get if they said something like i only care about one stat and that's the final score mm -hmm. where and that's the kind of thing that that you you sometimes hear like people say it say in hockey yeah like I'm not sure that internally it's treated much different, but that's the kind of thing you just can't say publicly in basketball right now because, like you know, the 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 the, the punditocracy will kill you. Um, so there is a, maybe a level of cultural acceptance because of that that hasn't quite hit hit the NFL yet. Um, yeah, I think, but on another level, like basketball, much like baseball because of both the number of games and the number of events in a game, you know, there's 150 shots taken in an NBA game, give or take multiplied by 1230 games a year. It's a big robust sample of this, of this one action. How many, uh, you know, I, I can't do the math in my head off, off that my head, but how many passes are thrown in an NFL season? Yeah, I mean a lot, <laughs> but but not but, but like orders of magnitude fewer. Yes, yeah, definitely orders of magnitude and, fewer. Yeah, and orders of magnitude fewer, and the 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 contextual factors that affect each one of those passes are far more varied than kind of you know the things that can go into a basketball shot, like how you get like from a strategic standpoint, how you get to the shot. There's, there's, that's where a lot of the really interesting stuff is happening that can vary. But once you get to, okay, well, the guys take, he's moving this speed and the defenders here and he's this far away from the basket and okay, we, 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 here's how we can, we can, that thing has happened thousands and thousands of times already. So we can, we can be pretty smart about it. That thing has happened dozens and dozens of times. In, in 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 the football context and so that's just the the level of of uh confidence you can have in any one thing is 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 probably higher in the former um but at the same time i think we're mistaking uh it we're, we're almost aiming at the wrong goal because you're not aiming for perfection you're aiming for better and so you can in a you you can't get to a precise very precise calculation necessarily in a small sample, but you can probably get somewhere directionally. And if you're somewhere directionally, like you're, you're, you know, as you said earlier, everything's wrong. You're less wrong. If you're less wrong than the next guy, if you're, you know, the, the NFL draft is hard. If you miss, miss on one fewer pick a year, how long does that take for you to be the best roster in the NFL? If the, if, I don't, like, I don't know what the, what, what the, what the averages break down, but if a team, you know, if the median NFL team got X number of real players out of the draft every year and one team figured it out enough that they got X plus one. Like that team, that that's a that is a Super Bowl contender every year pretty quickly, isn't it? Oh yeah. That's that yeah, I mean that's gonna <laughs> that's gonna that's gonna up your odds by by quite a bit to be able to build that roster. Okay, well let me think, okay. From your experience now in the NBA where where are we as far as because you talked about larger groups doing maybe even more intense analysis doesn't necessarily translate into being better if it's not integrated properly 
And is that because you, do you think there's still a lot of low hanging fruit that would be available there where that's kind of been the thing in the NFL for the longest time, as much as we would talk about being able to improve these things with tracking data and other stuff. It's like, Hey, there's still a ton of just like low hanging fruit that's out there. Is that still, is that the case in the NBA also? Uh, there is some, I'm smiling because uh, you know, there was a, uh, uh, NBA Finals Game Five was last night, and there was the uh, the the customary they don't need a three year rant by one of the broadcasters, and yeah, uh, and somehow and somehow people know that 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 those discussions are are, are perhaps triggering for me. It's like, <sighs> yes, there is some like like so there's some um, um, I I don't think that kind of late game optimal strategy has been has been full there there are definitely coaches that like I for example Quinn Snyder in Atlanta is is someone who I you, you know is someone who like studies these like decisions and the factors that go into it like okay time score fouls left fouls to give uh timeout situation like ha, has studied the interaction of those factors very well to 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 kind of have a sense of knowing what to do in a given spot it's it's you know that the, it, the, the, those factors are so complicated that it's why the the, the coach has a play card on the sideline in football because you have to have already made those decisions and yeah. I don't think I think that's an area where it hasn't really happened in basketball yet there hasn't they haven't okay if we're if we're up three with ten seconds left and a foul to give we foul on the inbounds pass like I, I don't know the degree to which those kind of thought games have been have been played out all the way through. I mean, it's, um, it's a little bit like maybe like fourth down decisions, I guess, yeah. in the NFL is but, that it's like intuition. Yeah. It's not wanting to have the game be over until the very end, if at all yeah. possible. Right. Like you say, go for two, have one more back and forth rather than just miss the three and have the game be over, even yeah. if that was the best course of action. Yeah. So that's I, but I would say that's a subset. And I think okay. that really that's not really where the integration part comes in. The integration yeah. is more again. It's it's if you're not asking the right questions, you can't get the right answers. If you something that I very frequently said when I was dealing with you know uh, execs, coaches, video, film, film room people is don't ask me a stat question. Ask me a basketball question, and that like let me figure out the stat that the, the or the mix of stats or the method or whatever that can address that and then i'll come back to you and to the extent that i need to explain the method or whatever so that you buy what i'm selling we can do that but mainly hopefully i've built up the trust that if you ask me what how well do we do x uh, relative to the league that when i come back with an answer it's not you know who has the highest points per possession in this situation that's that might be an answer but it's not necessarily the answer there's probably other stuff that goes into it um so the the example i often use is is the the you know who is the best shooter versus who has the highest three-point percentage who has the highest three-point percentage is a trivial question who is the best shooter is a much more difficult question because it involves like okay what do you mean by shooter Dude, like, the, are we just talking about standing or and standing around hitting an open jump shot? Are we talking about the versatility with which a player can take and make shots? Are we talking about players' willingness to take tough shots, even if they, you know, shots that might not be their highest percentage, but they will make well enough to be worth taking anyway? These are all factors that 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 would go into that. And if you're involved at the start of that process. You can have those discussions about what are we really trying to get at here? What's what's the problem we're really trying to solve? Instead of it just being a flat, you open your laptop, give me an answer, which you know is isn't useless, but it's far less helpful. It's it's answering a proxy for the question that you actually want to ask and didn't know how. And if you have the if you have the the right people in the room. They don't even have to be active participants. They just have to hear what the thing you're discussing is. And then they that gets a better sense of what you actually what what is the piece of information that is actually needed that will key this decision versus what do I think I know how to ask. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. That that definitely makes sense. I mean, yeah, it's a much more complicated 
situation sometimes. Well, I guess this would go back to kind of like what is analytics in a way. Because for NBA, maybe everyone would say it's just like, you know, take take threes and layups or something like that. And and, and that's that's analytics. Um, has that discussion? Where do you think we are on the arc of, of that of that discussion? I guess it would also be in the I would make a football analogy here. It's like passing the ball where every couple of years a team performs well in the NFL when they are running the ball a bit more. Uh, I remember there was uh, the Tennessee Titans and exotic smash mouth was their thing for a while. And it was, there's always like a call for a reverse for like a, a counter to the existing trend that never ends up coming. Um, where, where do you think we are on that sort of arc? Cause I assume it's the same thing in the NBA that there's like this feeling that at a certain point there'll be value. That'll be that'll, that'll open up outside of taking three pointers because everyone's doing it, but instead people have gotten even better at shooting three pointers. And then it just continues further down that road. I think it's interesting because it's an interesting time to have this conversation because I think we've actually kind of in the last couple of years have hit that inflection point where, there was a time where you kind of math your way to a good offense. Yeah. As teams were, as some teams were figuring out that, you know, three is greater than two and having your, your guy without the ball stand at 24 feet from the hoop instead of 18 feet from the hoop is better both when he catches the ball, but also when he doesn't, um, you know, when that was, when that realization was sort of still percolating through the league, you could math your way to a good offense just by shot profile and you can't really do that anymore, at least not offensively. You know, it's it's funny. It's still defensively the shots you give up relative to the league do still kind of dictate a little bit. Like, yes, you don't give up corner threes and you don't give up shots to the rim. You'll probably have a pretty good defense um, just when you're playing it. So, but on from an offensive standpoint, it's much more about uh, having guys who can make the shots they take. And there are are more ideal and less ideal kind of shot shot profiles in terms of where that brings you. But it's, it's returned much more to be that, that like shot making talent is the differentiator rather than just like, well, we are counting cards and you're not. So we win. Um, And so we've kind of, I think we've kind of hit the, I don't want to say the outer edge of the threes, but it's also the fact that defenses have gotten smarter about how they, about how they defend as well. Um, I think there's a, there's a very basic, uh, th- I think the, the way to illustrate this is a very basic like shell defense drill in basketball where, you know, based on how far away from the ball is, you know, you, you kind of, you, you position yourself. So you're between, you kind of have a triangle between the ball, the basket and your man and where the, where you, and the coaches will swing the ball around the perimeter and players will move. Uh, and, and then, you know, uh, something that, that, the part of it is to make sure you're paying attention. They'll start dribbling and everyone has to sprint to the ball, slap the ball, get back. Um, that drill has changed from when I was in college. Everyone would just sprint to the ball, slap the ball and get back. Now my old college team, the guys guarding the corners, they don't sprint to the ball. They face guard their guy because they know that's on penetration. That's the important thing to take away. So it's a strategic element of just a very basic drill that defense is caught up to what offense is trying to do and is adjusting to take away what they're actually trying to do, not sort of rotely doing the thing that would allow the offense to do what it wants to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's interesting that you say we're, we're pretty far along, if not all the way there, because I guess one thing that we had that I haven't had to deal with as much in football that would happen in other sports. And I remember there was an essay written by, I want to say it was Derek Thompson over the Atlantic about for the lack of a better word, analytics ruining all these different, <laughs> different things. And of course, baseball is the one thing that people will point to with the strikeouts and homers and, and all that sort of stuff. But then he was also talking about music becoming like all uh top 40 sort of situation there's less diversity there movies the same sort of thing i guess in basketball people could say the strategy that's being employed by teams become more homogenous what do, what do you think to this sort of charge um because i guess from my perspective it's not as if teams are doing anything any differently that they had done in the past they just may be more efficient in getting to this sort of value gains but h- how do you how do you take that charge and do you do you think there's any truth to something becoming worse if you can optimize it that much? 
Um, I think it's your, again, we're talking about things that are different. The sport effectiveness and the aesthetic are, are different axes of what we're looking at. And for, unfortunately for baseball, like the three true outcome style is aesthetically displeasing. Um, that it, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the case that in any other sport, and I don't think I don't I don't think there's um, any reason to suspect one way or the other, like you know, sight unseen, that the sort of dominant strategy, uh, as best we know, of being mo uh, most effective will necessarily be um, less aesthetically pleasing, uh, not least because defining aesthetically pleasing is 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 tough now i mean, I, I watch i watched the nba during the 90s trust me i saw some yeah. very non-aesthetically pleasing well yeah there. and and i but i think and in baseball it's like well i mean okay stuff is happening less so that's kind of there's let like there's less people people are running around much less because of the ball what about the ball. idea and number one yeah. is it more homogenous because of no the concrete insights that you can get no, no, you'd you'd say no. Okay, I, I would say I, I, you know, if you, you know, two of the, you know, the last two champions were both very effective offensive team. The Warriors and the Nuggets play nothing alike. The the champion before that, the Bucks, play nothing like either of those teams. There's certain similarities in that they are trying to get to similar places. But I've always found that charge is like, hey, why are these NFL teams all trying to score touchdowns? Won't someone think of the field goals? <laughs> right. Which is just, it's, just, it's, it's, it's ludicrous. And, but I mean, from a state, like, I've gone and looked, and we have a decade, a little more than a decade, probably 15, 16 years of reasonable play type data. And I've actually gone and looked and seen how, you know, done an analysis to see how homogenous the league is and like how they're getting to their shots. Um, and while the overall league profile has changed greatly, the kind of spread of how the, the, the 30 teams at any one time are doing it hasn't really changed. There were actually like in, at times, you know, I've mentioned earlier how there was a time you could math your way to stuff. That was actually, um, a period of fairly broad, bro much broader than usual kind of, uh, stylistic diversity, but that was because like some teams were, advancing with the times and some teams weren't so it was, it was more just like the trailing edge was bad rather than there being this like desirable diversity um so a lot of it is it's you know to some extent the league has always been a copycat league and like whatever has worked most recently everyone thinks that's the best way to do things and that's something that predates analytics by 40 years so i i and and just on a on a qualitative level, I just absolutely reject the notion that if you're just looking at like the shot charts, maybe it looks like everyone's playing similar. If you watch the damn games, <laughs> they're not. <laughs> they're doing things very differently. Like Nikola Jokic and Stephen Curry, nothing alike in how they play basketball. Isn't it a little okay? Well, how, uh, let, let's let's think of this then. I guess it's just we have for such a long period of time the most dominant offensive players were i mean it's probably not necessarily aesthetically pleasing that it was like you have abnormally freakishly tall human beings you'd throw the ball to and they skilled or not on a certain sort of level that was a lot of a lot of the offenses being played but i mean how do you think about these players i guess i guess some there's like this nostalgia factor for everything if we're talking about i don't know anyone from you know, Akeem Olajuwon to Shaquille O'Neal, I guess Akeem Olajuwon a little bit less so, but Shaq or something like, like how would they even function in today's NBA in the same just sort of fine? Offensive? You think Shaq would function just <laughs> yes. fine? Yes. I mean, for like, you see how, uh, if you watch this year's playoffs, you see how teams struggled to cope with Jokic's size. No disrespect yeah. to Jokic, but in terms of like size and explosiveness, like there's nobody in the NBA like Shaq. Shaq would be just fine. In today's NBA, people forget that like young Shaq was also like extremely mobile and athletic. Like your image is maybe more like late Lakers period Shaq, 
where yeah like he was like coming out of lsu shack was yeah. actually seen as being a dominant defensive force before being a before and really and being he, an and, offensive and, force and, and throughout his prime he was like there's some of his later lakers years where in the regular season he kind of just didn't give a shit yeah he, he was loafing it he was loafing yeah it. and then but then the playoffs it's like you know okay you see this you see this 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 box with a different colored like like paint on the floor you can't come yeah. in here yeah um so i think that um now would it would he do things differently would he probably have to be more of a pick and roll player than just a straight post up guy yeah probably but that's as much about rule changes as it is about um like analytics per se i wrote about this in the book about how um like again saying analytics did this three point thing is proving too much because really it started with rule changes in the early 2000s that like led to more perimeter play for because you couldn't put your hand on a small guard on the perimeter anymore. So all of a sudden small quick guard has an advantage that they didn't have before over the, you know, the, the bulky six, six guy who maybe can't handle the ball. Uh, and you can, when you could sort of the old defense rules meant you basically had to almost point and declare who you're guarding and be very close to them. And when those rules were relaxed, now you can kind of play, you can play off a guy if he can't shoot. You can sort of half zone. You can pretend like you're double teaming and then not. You just make it difficult for a guy in the post to figure out where help is coming from or not and where the ball should go. So that's as much of a reason why the post-up game has, fa has faded as anything else is defenses are allowed to guard it better. It's no longer the case where Charles Barkley could send you three goes guys to go stand on the other side of the floor. Your guys have to go with you no matter how bad a shooter you are. And I'm going to back down until one of those guys comes and double teams me. Or if they don't, I'm going to back down until I score. You can't, that, that's not a style you can do now because the, the, the defense isn't going to let you because they don't have to. If you've got one of your guys on the other side as your center who can't shoot past, past the length of his arm, he can stand out there all he wants. I'm not going to be anywhere near him. But you could, but in the old rules, I had to guard him. I had to guard Mark Eaton like he was Mark Price. Well, what do you think about the discussions of the state of the of the game? This probably wasn't the greatest finals matchup from a uh, rating standpoint or something like that. So, you, do do you think the quality of the actual play, or is this more like macro factors of? You know, not having a dominant team anymore. People love dominance, despite what they may say. Um, well, well, what do you think about the state of the game? It's a, a complicated question. I think so. First of all, I think the early. I haven't seen like the the final ratings yet, but at least yeah. early in the series, it seemed like they were pretty comparable to last year's. Which, considering last year was two glamour teams in Golden State and Boston, yeah, probably speaks well of people being interested. Um, I do think we are in sort of a a transitional period in that a lot of the kind of the previous generation of stars, you know, LeBron's, Chris Paul's, Kevin Durant's are kind of hitting that part where they're aging out of like either have aged or aging out of like top relevance and a new way. The new wave hasn't totally come up behind them. There's, there's Jokic and Embiid and, but Luca might not quite be there yet. And whoever the next group is, Victor Wembanyama is is obviously very highly touted and is um, it's kind of a very interesting period because this is the 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 best prospect since LeBron legitimately yeah. is in the draft this year. Um, but we're also or the according standpoint. to some people the be better the better prospect. I, I think I think that's I think that's a completely credible argument. By the way, is I it? Think, eh, yeah, well, maybe, maybe. Yeah, I, I mean, guess it's, it's, it's weird. I mean, he's tall. I guess yeah. Even, it's weird to say that like tall matters that much when there's three pointers such a big deal. But that is something. Well, he's seven five and can shoot one legged threes yeah. off the dribble. So, yeah. um, no, and and the other part of that is like LeBron has become you know made himself one of the top three players of all time like you can argue yeah. kareem you can argue mj i will not hear arguments for anybody else but um the get from lebron as a prospect to that is still lebron yeah. hitting like his 95th percentile outcome from right. a from a development standpoint right. so as a prospect um he could be Wimbenyama could be a better prospect than lebron and is still a massive dog to be as have have you know anything close to the career um, right but we're all but 
we're, we're also in a period where we are between kind of, you know, we don't have the heat. Uh, we don't have like the, even that mid uh, 2010 Spurs team. We don't have the, the, uh, the, the death lineup warriors The the nuggets may develop into that. Like they, there's certainly a chance they could, but other than that, we're kind of in a period sort of, you know, like we were the years that Michael Jordan was retired um, in, in, you know, the, the, the year the Rockets won two championships where there wasn't like that dynasty of a team or kind of the period between when Jordan retired and when the Kobe Shaq Lakers kind of became that thing. Um, so what's next is kind of a little bit unknown because everything is sort of getting reordered and you throw on top of that a new CBA, which is just signed, which is going to, you know, engender a whole new team building equilibrium, which uh, has ha- impacts analytics uh, in a way because, you know, when things are different, they're different. And so yeah. now you have to, you know, when we're talking about making it's good, like, different, yeah, something is change is good. Yeah, yeah. 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 But so a lot of some of the underlying assumptions that like, you know, would, would undergird like uh, 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 recommendations might not be true anymore. And it's going to take us a f- people a few years to like, Oh wait, that's a no. Wait, that's not true anymore. The the why that this that, that I would have said to do this isn't true anymore. Let me think about what should actually happen, and that's going to take a little bit as as the sort of the new rules start to to, to percolate through. All right, um, I think I've taken more than enough of your time, Seth. I appreciate you joining me. This has been fantastic. Follow him on Twitter at Seth Part. Now, anything else you want to? plug or talk about or anything exciting on the way stats bomb e coming into the 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 season this year the college or nfl season i'm really excited about some of the stuff that we that we are having development around sort of automatic automated recognition of 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 formations and 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 routes and 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 things like that i think you should uh follow uh, the stats bomb uh uh, uh football uh, twitter stats bomb underscore fb um and we'll be tweeting out some of the new stuff regularly and uh uh have have uh have matt edwards uh, was formerly director of analytics for university of virginia be write, writing some articles and our our data science group will be producing some stuff as well um i'm really very excited about some of the stuff that we have kind of right around the corner it's like i can't show it to people yet but it's like it's almost there we well, had some very cool draft stuff that we saw. I saw a few people on Twitter, whether it was Bill Connolly and some others that were able to integrate it, send it out. There were articles that also came out at the Stats Bomb site. So, yeah, that's going to be awesome to see all of that going forward. A, a welcome addition to, to, to the football space for Stats Bomb to come in there. It's such a highly respected company, obviously, with everything that's gone on uh, with international soccer. All right. Thank you so much, Seth, for joining me. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, I'll be talking at you later this week for a solo pod, and then we'll have Ben Taylor uh, from Thinking Basketball next week to have some more NBA talk. And then uh, I guess he was like a Chiefs fan back in the two, two back in the aughts or something. So maybe we'll talk about that a little bit also. All right. Thanks, everybody.